We need to continue to shift perceptions on the subject of equine welfare. And there are some perception issues around how the horses are looked after. You know, if I said to you that 99.82% of horses come back from their races perfectly safe across the 87,000 runs that happen in the UK every year, that that fatality rate, infinitesimally small though it is, has come down by a third in the last 10 years, that we as an industry have invested over 40 million over the last 20 years in welfare improvements, not just at race courses, but at yards and everywhere else. This sport has never been safer than it is now. Nevin, welcome to the Business of Sport. Thank, Thank you. you so lovely much for joining here. us. No, lovely to be here. Really, really looking forward to it. It's a huge time for racing at the moment. This time of year always brings a lot of attention to the sport. I would love to start with the Jockey Club. Um, a lot of people, I think, associate the Jockey Club as a race course ownership organisation. But the reality is it's a lot more than that. Yeah. Can you give us the full context as to what the organisation actually does within the industry? Yeah, the, I mean, the jockey, the, the historic origins, if we were to go back to that very briefly, or that the jockey club is, was the first club to really put together a set of rules and regulations for the sport of horse racing, even before race courses were invented. We're going back here to the mid 18th century and possibly earlier, where we're not quite, some of the historical records actually go back um, further than that. And that was the, eventually and over time, that was the organization that designed the rules, designed the regulations, mainly for what at the time were just head to head, two horses, my horse against your horse, starting out at six mile bottom, six miles out of Newmarket, then finishing on Newmarket High Street, and the bet would be settled based on which horse won. That was the origins of it. And the, and the Jockey Club rooms, which are still you know, the historic heart of the club today, is where all of that took place. And over time, um, it, it evolved into effectively the ruler and regulator of all horse racing in the UK. Um, in the mid-60s, I think it was, it merged with what was then called the National Hunt Committee to put um, flat racing and national hunt racing, which is a much more, actually a more modern phenomenon on race courses than flat racing. Flat racing goes back, as I say, to the mid-17th mid century, 16th, 18th century, but jumps racing we really came on race courses in mid to late 19th century. So those two merged and you had um, the Jockey Club um, effectively doing discipline, rules setting and rules amendment, um, plus race programming for the whole sport. Over time um, and post Second World War, um, started to buy up distressed assets effectively, race courses that were probably in some cases otherwise going to the wall or that needed um, long-term security, cleared the debt, invested in the facilities, set up a, um, a, 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 a arm's length entity called Racecourse Holdings Trust, which today is Jockey Club Racecourses, and started to build a portfolio of racecourses through that entity. Cheltenham, believe it or not, was the first of those in 1964, right through to Exeter um, in 2007, and the other 13 at various points in between became part of the group that we see today. They are all individual businesses in their own right, so the group strategy that we've got that we'll come on to, I'm sure, around how we help the sport to thrive long term is really important to the long term success of those race courses. But ultimately, those race courses sit on their own as individual entities and venues as well. Over time, the governance of the sport changed. The British Race Horse Racing Authority that we now know today was formed, I think, in the early 2000s. So the Jock Club effectively ceded all of that to um, the British Horse Racing Authority. The reason for that was very simple. You, you had a situation where you had one entity that wasn't just um, commercial rights holder and venue owner for some venues, but not all. It was also regulating the sport. Mm. It's a bit like the FA in football owning seven or eight championship clubs. Yep. There's obviously a very clear conflict of interest there, all, I mean, aside from the fact that Race Coast Holdings Trust was at arm's length. So that's evolved really into what we see today. We have the British Horse Racing Authority as regulator um, of the sport. We have the various race course groups and individual race courses as commercial rights holders, of which we are one. We are, we are 15, arena racing um, are 16, and the rest of the courses are independent. Um, and then we have three other businesses as well. We, we own and we operate all the Gallops land in Newmarket, in Lambourne, in Berkshire, and in Epsom. So that's where the horses train every day on grass gallops. Um, on wood chip gallops and all sorts of different surfaces. And they're between the, across those locations, depending on time of year, there's probably about three, just over 3,000 horses in training across those wow. three locations. That's about a fifth of the total horses that are in training in the, in the UK. Um, we have the National Stud, which is our breeding um, and education business. So we, we stand stallions. We do diploma courses for the stud managers, bloodstock agents of tomorrow. Very, very important channel for bringing through talent in the sport. Um, and then we have our charity, um, Racing Welfare, which is really important to you know the long-term health of 
the sport in terms of looking after people in the sport, working in the sport who are um, less well off, fall on hard times. And the interventions that Racing Welfare have made in that space, especially since COVID, have been absolutely critical. We operate entirely commercially. The company is incorporated by Royal Charter, um, long-term debt funded, no equity, which means we can think long-term in terms of our investments. We can think about the structure of our balance sheet and how that allows us to invest not just in um, our assets and our infrastructure, but also in our race program. Um, so you for and, profit? I think we're for profit, but it's what we do with that profit that's different when, when we get it. We don't pay dividends. We reinvest every penny of that profit back into the sport in some way. So the more efficiently we're operating, the more commercially successful we are, then the more headroom we've got to invest in, as I say, infrastructure of our race courses, big, some big long-term capital investments there, also systems and infrastructure investment around our digital platforms, which I'm sure we'll come on to, but then also into our race program as well. So just to put that into context, when I, when I say that, I'm really talking about what, what we term in racing prize money. So that is what that is really the oil that keeps the engine of the sport going. That's how um, the money gets distributed around the sport. That supports uh, trainers, owners, jockeys, stable staff to reinvest in you know, yeah. extra, a, a additional blood stock to be, to really keep the sport running. Historically, has that been different? Has money gone, let's say, to the race course development and management, not necessarily the training side, and now it's started to shift? Well, I think it's it's shifted a bit. I mean, there are three basic sources of prize money in British racing. Our prize funds this year are around about 60 million. So just to put that into context, um, that's 60 million over, in our case, about 340 fixtures. And we're running you know, the, the top races like the Derby, the Cheltenham Gold Cup, the Grant National for you know, the significant values we run them for. Um, we are providing ourselves to our own to our own investment somewhere just over fifty percent of that, so about um, somewhere around 31, 30, 31. 8 million, I think it is this year. The, the other, the rest of it comes from the horse race betting levy, which is a ten percent levy on all um, on gross, gross gambling yield for all the gambling operators who operate through online and in shops and through entry stakes. So those are the three main sources of prize money. So. I see us very much in that space as being if we're, if we're competing or we're operating for the long-term good of and health of this sport, then our race program and what it delivers to participants, what it delivers to trainers, to owners, to jockeys, is incredibly important. Not just in attracting the best runners. You no, know, the same principle applies in many sports. The the, the 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 top participants effectively follow the money. We've seen that, you know, in football. We've seen that with the IPL and cricket. This is no different, and. Our race program, both on the jumps and on the flat, is competing with other race courses, first and foremost, but on the flat also internationally. And what you run a race for and the, and the prize fund you have for that race is one factor, not the only factor, but a significant factor in trainers, mainly trainers, deciding where they're going to run in terms of how they program a horse. So it is in our interest in investing in the long-term health of our business to make sure we're attracting the best runners um, to our top venues and, all, and prize money is a big part of that. Another huge part of it is audience yeah. and your ability to attract fans. Racing is a huge sport yeah. in this country. Right? What are the statistics around how it sits alongside your footballs, the crickets, the rugby's yeah, this, this from a viewership is, perspective? This is, this is really interesting one, Charlie, because I think a lot of people probably watching racing week to week or not watching it or on even watching this podcast probably don't realize what a what a huge sport indeed a huge industry we're actually dealing with here so I'll, I'll just give you a few sort of proof points around that this is the second most attended sport in the country after football we have um somewhere around just under six million people coming racing every year across all the 58 race courses in England, Scotland and Wales. That is 6 million people attending race courses yeah. in this country. Wow. We have a ITV. Um, it's the biggest terrestrial live sport now. Um, we have a over 100 um, live terrestrial days on ITV1 and ITV4, combination of. It's a sport and an industry that contribute to over 4 billion to the UK economy in terms of the, the economic impact that it has in the sort of places I mentioned earlier. If you go to a Newmarket or a Lambourne or a Middleham in North Yorkshire, um, you will see that these communities depend on racing and breeding for their longevity. Yeah. We employ as a sport, and including the breeding industry, about indirectly, indirectly and indirectly about 88,000 people. And there are about 15,500 horses in training, doing about 87,000 runs a year across about 1,400 racing fixtures. So it is a it is a big 
well watched sport, over 10 billion bet on it every year. Um, and it is something that ultimately contributes significantly to the rural economy. Is that 10 billion in the UK or globally? Yeah, yeah in the UK. It's also a massive part of um, what, what I would term in, inward investment into the UK. We were talking off air about um, um, our international links and especially to the Middle East, but other areas of the world as well. And you consistently have owners who are based in other countries who are investing in horses here. And that's ultimately creating employment here. Because the more horses there are in training, the more prosperous the sport is, the more open the sport is, the more people, you know, that a John Dawson or William Haggis or whoever as a trainer is going to need in their yard looking after those horses. So we are not just talking here about a sport. We are talking here about a very significant industry that is a mm. big part of the fabric of rural life in this country, especially. Which I think leads into a really interesting conversation around the type of fan as well. Yeah. Because you have, and this is my perception, please correct me if I'm wrong, you have a big challenge with a sport like horse racing, which is you have to appease to the purist who loves the core integrities of the sport that have existed for a certain yeah. amount of time. You also have to look at how the sport develops and attracting new audiences, new eyeballs. It's an attention economy. How are you bringing in holding, but also creating a product for the future, not just for the length of a TikTok yeah. video. How do you approach Absolutely. the um, the contrast between the two? Do you even see it as a contrast? I do see it as a contrast, and it's one of we well, it's one we deal with all the time. If I look at even even some you know recent examples, we'll come on maybe later to the changes we made, for example, to the Grand National. You know, there are some purists who see that race as sacred, who for legitimate reasons feel that those changes were not necessary. But that's one example of where we're taking the subject of equine welfare and we're saying we are going to we need to shift, continue to shift perceptions on this. And there are some perception issues around how the horses are looked after. Um, there are some perception issues, especially among younger audiences, about that particular subject. You know, if I said to you that 99.82% of horses come back from their races perfectly safe across the 87,000 runs that happen in the UK every year, um, that that fatality rate, infinitesimally small though it is, has come down by a third in the last 10 years, um, that we as an industry have invested over 40 million over the last 20 years in welfare improvements, not just at race courses, but at, but at yards and everywhere else. It's those, some of those proof points that begin to, begin to say to people, actually, this sport has never been safer than it is now. And reaching those new younger audiences for us is absolutely key. Showing that sport is open and welcoming, showing that you, know, you don't have to dress a certain way or act in a certain way to come, to come racing. You know, we, we, we made a decision last year to drop all our dress codes from all our race days you know, to be able to say to people, come dress to, 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 make, to feel your best, to, to make you whatever you feel comfortable in. Lots of people love dressing up coming racing. It, it's seen as, it's perceived therefore as elitist. It so isn't. Yep. If, if you look at, um, if you walk around a race course on a, on a big day or even a smaller day, you will see people from all sorts of different socioeconomic backgrounds. You'll see a really good gender mix. You'll see families. You'll see people there, you know, with their friends enjoying themselves. It's such a wide range of, of groups of people. And coming back to your question, you then have, you, you, you're catering for a, a lot of different groups, a lot of different tribes, if you will, in terms of their expectations of the day. You have the hardcore purists who love the sport, maybe who love betting on it, but genuine who love the horse and the sport and the infrastructure of the sport. You have the day outers. You have the people who are there new, just exploring and, and getting to know it um, and, and really understanding what a race day is about. And our job is to make sure that the sport and indeed the race day is open and welcoming for all those people that we can demonstrate that you know this is a something that can be really be enjoyed over a long period of five six hours you know seven eight races a lot of the time and that there's a lot of other things to do off, off course yeah. sorry on course in between and off the track I don't know if you saw uh, in the build-up to Cheltenham on one of the days, um, Ollie Bell and Matt Chapman had a big discussion around footfall and getting people through the doors yeah. and the right type of um, spread, should we say, of the young, making it more accessible, yeah. getting them in, reducing it for university, whatever that may be. Did you have a view on that? Yes, I mean, I think that's really important because ultimately attracting, you know, that that, that group, I mean, we're the, first of all, we're the only sport where under 18s come in for free in the large majority of our um, of, of our um, fixtures. We have discount rates for, you know, people student age and just above 18 to 18 to 25 at a lot of the big festivals. That's something I think we'll be doing more of. Um, if I looked around Cheltenham Festival, despite the fact that it's midweek this year, I'd see, I, I felt 
And I think a lot of people agreed that there was a there was an even younger vibe to it, which is brilliant. And we're attracting that sort of, I think we're increasingly attracting that age group. And once they come, you know, the majority of them you speak to have a brilliant time. It's getting them through the door to start with and making sure they're incentivized to come through the door. And that isn't just about the experience they have on course. That goes to our whole digital strategy and the mm -hmm. digital platforms we build as well. You know, racing, I think, lends itself really well to those sort of short bite-sized chunks of action because ultimately you know, a five or six furlong sprint at Royal Ascot can be less than a minute. Even even a longer race like the Cheltenham Gold Cup is, you know, depending on ground, is 10, 11 minutes. And sports fans now, especially younger sports fans, want to be drawn in by those sort of bite-sized chunks of action. Racing's really sit, well set up to do that. Completely. So what we're doing, you know, on our digital platforms, on TikTok, on Twitter, on all the other um, platforms and channels on that is so important in hooking that digital fan in as much as you know the, the yeah. physical fan. That's going to be a really big part of our strategy going forward. You know, so, we, we had I think we had across Cheltenham alone this year we had over thirty million views of our digital content really? films and and one hundred and fifty million views overall last year. So that's the sort of scale of the digital platform we're dealing with. So you haven't felt compromised in uh, the maintenance of a print racing post versus the TikTok channel that you create. Not really, no, because I mean, at the end of the day, th there's a place for both. Yep. I mean, ev everyone, I remember, you know, 20 years ago when the, sort of the internet first became a thing, everyone was proclaiming the yeah. death of newspapers. I don't think that's ever going to happen because I think there'll, there'll always be a market. That market may change and evolve, but there'll always be a market, I think, for a, a print version of, of, of coverage of whatever, not just sport, but all sorts of things. And racing is no different to that, so I think there'll always be a place for that. But increasingly, I mean, a lot of people say to me, "Oh, well, there isn't much racing. There isn't as much racing coverage on the sports pages of, you know, the Express or the Mail or the Telegraph as there used to be." That may well be the case. I think that's an issue for other sports, all, all sports, other than football, by the way, because I think football's taken a lot of that space. Yeah. But I, I don't get too concerned about that because ultimately, it's it's becoming more and more about your your digital platform coverage. Um, and not just the sort of stuff I was talking about earlier on, you know, the, the digital content and the background um, coverage and so on, mm. behind the scenes coverage, which, which I'm sure we'll come on to, but also, you know, podcasts and things that generate interest in the sport, use of data. That's the other thing we're doing a lot of, you know, in terms of how we analyze the data around stride lengths, jump efficiency, all that sort of stuff. All of those things that give real insight into what the sport is actually about and where races are won and lost, I think it's, it's fascinating for new fans. Content distribution, media rights, it's integral right, yeah. to sport now. Yeah. It drives the finances of the majority of sports. And you just highlighted moving your strategy from maybe the core linear um, that has dominated for the majority mm. of racing yeah. into now this multi-content, multi-platform yeah. strategy. How did you first begin to embrace that? How how did you realise that this was something that you had to do as a sport? I think in many ways it just happened naturally. You know, I, I think I should probably say up front, try the, the the linear coverage we get from ITV in particular, but also through our own subscription channel, Racing TV, mm. is and will continue to be incredibly important. You know, ITV is ultimately the short window for our sport and the coverage that they, you mentioned um, Matt and Ollie earlier, the, the coverage yeah. that whole team do, it's absolutely fantastic and has been you know, a real game changer for the sport in terms of how it engages people and how it explains you know, the, what's going on to new audiences. So, so that will always be important. It became fairly obvious to us, you know, probably four or five years ago, that you know, new audiences play in a, in a different space. It's very rare now for young sports fans to sit and watch a whole afternoon of racing on ITV or even a 90-minute football match. Mm. I'd be the same, actually. You know, I, Unless it was sort of Liverpool-Man City or Liverpool-Man United, I'd probably, we'd probably tell you I support. I wouldn't sit and watch a game for 90 minutes unless I was at the game. But so increasingly, people of all ages, but it's certainly age sort of 35 and below, are consuming their content in very, very different ways. And having a proper digital platform strategy for this, it, it wasn't, to me, to us, it wasn't a choice. Having to, and, and developing this in terms of in-house capability as well became, has become incredibly important for us. How influential is media rights to your wider finances? Very influential, very important. So just give you a sense of, you know, there are basically there are essentially four income streams from media rights. One is 
um, just the basic rights in picture rights into the betting shops, um, which is steady state, not declining that much. Second is online. Um, you know, the, we get a clip of the ticket basically for each online bet that's um, that, that's placed on our races in terms of the, so the bigger the betting turnover, the bigger our income. Third is the international element and what we get from exporting. We're, we're exporting pictures certainly of our flat racing to over 60 countries. Um, and the biggest markets are the Middle East, the Far East and Australia. So those, those are significant, reasonably significant and growing revenue streams for us. Um, and then the fourth is obviously the terrestrial contract with ITV. And overall for the jockey club, um, across those those different areas, that's about that's somewhere between twenty five and thirty percent of our total revenues. How long are your rights cycles? Varies. Um, usually between anywhere between three and five years, depending on the obviously mo- most of the online deals are sort of about three years, and because that's such an evolving market, I think from and obviously those all those contracts are with betting operators. You know the the flutters, the bet three six fives. Who are the big online players, and then the, the, the William Hills, the, the Ladbrokes, the Corals of this world as well, all are important. Some of the smaller, more challenger betting brands are becoming important yep. too. So those those online rights tend to be on a, either a two or three year cycle. ITV is a bit longer than that. Um, current contract expires, I think, at the end of 2026. Do you expect more competition for that moving forward? Well, less reference, maybe boxing, who, you know, obviously were with, well, a lot of boxing was yeah. with Sky for many years, and Zone come in with an OTT proposition that's slightly different. Yeah. Can you envision I can, that yes. becoming more prevalent for you? Yeah, I can. I think I think increasingly, I mean, we're obviously in conversations with ITV at the minute, but their own OTT strategy and ITVX and where that fits into their long-term strategy and how that might impact us. But I can see... And well, indeed, we're already thinking about what, what we can do with, you mentioned the zone and also see YouTube as well as an important element. But we have to get that in perspective. Um, certainly for a, for a sport like racing, those audiences and those audience reaches are still quite small compared to the, you know, the, the mass terrestrial appeal of, of an ITV. So it, it's a balance. Yeah. But I think over time, what you're saying is absolutely right, that that, that balance is going to shift. Well, you can fall into the challenge that something like Wimbledon or the Olympics or the Six Nations may have, which is these are such historically important events, the biggest races yep. to the culture of this country, the Grand National, you know, whether it be Cheltenham. Those are things that you sit down with the family and watch. They played a huge role in many people's love of exactly. racing. So to take yep. that and put it behind a pay will make it less accessible is something you probably have to really factor I, into this as well as I obviously looking at the financial numbers. couldn't agree more, Charlie. I think um, there, there's, a, there's a space in my mind for both. Having, you know, ultimately, the, the reason that's even more important in racing is because um, you know, safe and responsible betting on the sport is a big part of the sport's lifeblood, probably like no other sport. What drives that? It's eyeballs and it's exposure. And the bigger the exposure, i.e. a terrestrial TV platform, the, the bigger that betting spin-off is likely to be. So whilst, we, whilst the rights fee that we receive from ITV is important to us commercially, the, the, the really big commercial impact of having a terrestrial platform, and we can see this in all the stats, is that ultimately is the, is the betting turnover that it drives. So that's, that's an important angle. And also, as you say, you know, races like the Cheltenham Gold Cup, you know, the Betfred Derby, the Randox Grant National, all of those, in my mind, are sporting institutions. Yeah. They're up there with you know, the Silverstones, the Wimbledons, you know, the, the Lord's Ashes Test, in, this, in, my, in my mind, as being you know, really premium sporting assets yeah. for this country. And I think it would be a very significant, indeed brave step if we said, actually, we're going to have that behind the paywall. I'm not sure in the long run that would do the sport any good. You know, we've seen this, the struggles, that's the right word, they, they've solved it in a different way. But if you look at what cricket did in the sort of mid-2000s, when they went exclusively behind the sky paywall, mm. for a while there, there was a danger. I think they've corrected it now with the 100. But for a while there, there was a danger that a whole generation who couldn't see, you know, Joe Root and Ben Stokes and Stuart Broad playing test cricket on a, on a day-to-day basis, um, that that generation potentially was going to be lost to the sport. Now, I think they've done a brilliant job of getting mm. that back. But we need to be careful as a sport about, um, you know, on, underestimating the impact of, you know, a terrestrial platform versus other um, pay- pay- paywall platforms. You referenced the uh, importance of betting. Yeah. How, and this is a really poor question, I appreciate it, um, but we've seen an increasing amount of attention towards the advertising of betting in football, for example, recently. Your industry, you know, within racing is so influential within that betting 
ecosystem and you rely heavily, as you said, on the finances yeah. that are generated through it without putting any words in your mouth. How does it work? This is one of our, you know, our biggest sort of macro issues. That I think the sport faces in terms of, but both in terms of some of the perception stuff we were talking about earlier, but also just in terms of pure public affairs and dealing with government, because you probably know that the government are in the middle of doing some much needed reform of the gambling laws in this country at the minute. You know, they're nearly 20 years out of date and the, and the world has moved on a lot mm. in 20 years in terms of how people, in terms of how people gamble online and indeed offline. The first thing to say is that, you know, the large majority of people who bet on racing, indeed who bet on sport, but especially on racing, do it perfectly safely and responsibly um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't some people on racing or gambling on racing who might say are you know, problem gamblers however that is defined and has to find in many different ways but it's a very very small percentage it, it's it's certainly well done into single figures I think it's important to differentiate racing as a, as a you know, effectively as a game of skill to the extent that people have I don't have much skill on it but many many do when, when you're betting on it versus games of chance Let's let's call that casino slots yep. online. You know, John Gosden, the tra well-known trainer, refers to it as like a casino in people's pockets. He's not wrong. Making that differentiation between different types of gambling, um, where you know there is a break in between. It is there. It is skill based you know, for sport, not just for racing, but you know betting on football, cricket, rugby union. There is all an element of knowledge and skill to that, as opposed to you know a, a, a spin product where you can be spinning. You know. 10 times, 15 mm. times a minute and losing, you know, quite a lot of money. So I think I think that differentiation is really, really important. So our key focus here is making sure that people understand that the large majority of betting on racing, as I say, is done safely and responsibly, um, that we put very much at the heart of our strategy, you know, safer gambling. You know, if you look at just the rules that govern the ring, the betting ring or the race course, all the way through to the online provisions that the, that the betting operators put in place. You know, there are some very clear um, laws and limits already in there. Being able to show that, certainly to politicians and indeed to the world, that actually the, the importance of this very safe betting that goes into horse racing is important to its long-term um, health, its economics, and the, and the people whose jobs depend on it, never mind the people who come yeah. to watch it. So it's, it is a balance. But I think we're, we I think demonstrating that you know betting on racing, betting on sport is much safer, is different. I think we are in danger in this country a little bit of um, you know the whole concept of gambling becoming toxic. When in reality, the lo very large majority of people, you know, I'm talking well into the high ninety percent of people who gamble do so no matter what they're gambling, perfectly safely and responsibly. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the message that we're very clear in getting across. You mentioned 10 billion was the yeah. spend earlier. Do you know what the split is between what's put online and what's actually put at the race yeah, course? Yes, so it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's significantly skewed to online. So it's over 70% now um, is, is bet online. Yeah. Um, when people are at the races, platforms. do you think they, do they bet online when they're at the races? Because yes. when I go, I still like to go to the stool. Yeah, I'd be the same. But um, we know that from, you know, obviously we have... Um, on course Wi-Fi now, as you'd expect, and all big venues have, and indeed we've just upgraded that last year. Um, so we know that a lot of people who bet both with you know, pool betting and also fixed odds will will actually will be betting on their phones at the race course. The the, the amount that's bet in the ring, which is done privately, you know, with the with the bookmakers who who rent that space from us, is actually a very small proportion mm. of the overall amount bet. Um, if you, especially if you look at a big, take the Derby as a big sort of internationally exposed flat race. It's 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 part of something called the Whirlpool, which is hosted by the Hong Kong Jockey Club, but effectively is a commingling of all the pools, um, pool bets around the world into one big pool. Um, there will be I don't have the numbers in my head, but there will be billions bet on that race, and that will all be commingled in one place, which is very valuable for us, and also gives you a much better, a much more significant um, proposition to the customer. So. The, the fact is that large majority of betting activity is you don't see. You do, you see people in a shop, you see people on the race course, but that that is becoming an increasingly smaller part of the overall betting activity, and certainly on a, on a big international fat race that is internationally exposed across you know, 60, 70 countries, or even a Cheltenham Festival race, which is less exposed because you're really only, jumps racing really, really only is it's a big thing in three countries, but still a very significant yeah. online presence. We talked about, we touched on a few things um, surrounding perception yeah. issues.
And whether the sport has a perception issue, I guess, is, is an interesting question in itself based on a few of the things that we've, we've talked through. But whether it be betting, whether it be animal welfare, can we actually look at um, the challenge that has come up over the last few years and the protesting that has started to take place at the race courses and how you as an organisation have approached that in the context of the jockey club, but also in the context of horse racing as yeah. a whole. I mean, I think it's a, great, it's a great question and it's a subject, obviously, I think in some ways, you know, we, we probably did see it coming because we've always had people um, protesting and expressing their point of view about horse racing and its perceived cruelty outside the gates on a big day. It'd be quite common to see them at, you know, at Epsom or, or at Aintry or even at, at Royal Ascot in reasonably small numbers over the years. But again, it's very much their place to be able to have their point of view. It's a free country, free expression, and I 100, we would 100% support that position and enabling them to do that. I think what the recent protests of last year have actually enabled us to do is be able to say, being able to get out there and say, actually, this sport has probably never been safer. We were talking earlier on about some of the welfare stats and how well these horses are looked after. Mm -hmm. You know, they have five-star treatment, both at the race course and back at their yards. Um, they are born and bred in order to race. The, the logical conclusion of the agenda of those who, who object to horse racing, and they would have to accept this because it's a biological fact, is that the, the thoroughbred would not exist. Because without racing, both flat or national hunt, there would be no breeding. And without breeding, there's no thoroughbred. It's as simple as that. So that's the trade-off. And that's the that's the ultimate outcome of what would happen if you, yeah. if you didn't have horse racing. But Dan, I think to go back to your question, in terms of how we've dealt with that, we were very clear from the outset that the point of view that they're expressing is legitimate. The way they're going about it was maybe less so. And we were very clear that we wanted to win that argument for reasonable opinion. What what um, Stuart, our corporate affairs director, and I call the sort of the persuadable public. And it's a big rump of people in the middle. You know, there's probably about, our polling shows there's about, there's 20 odd percent on one side who are diehard fans and just, you know, absolutely fine with everything that goes on, love coming racing. There's probably about the same percentage of people on the other side, maybe slightly less, who are not persuadable at all. And there's no point in trying to persuade those people. You're wasting your time, but it's that bigger group in the middle who perceive the sport generally fairly positively. But, but want to be reassured and want to be persuaded that, you know, this sport is as safe as it can be. I think most people in society would accept that you will never um, eliminate risk entirely from any sport, any activity. But our job in racing at the Jogging Club is to make sure that, you know, we're investing in the right place. We're doing the right data analytics around what brings, you know, accidents about. So we're investing in the right places around the fences, the ground, the horse walks, the setup of the race conditions, mm. um, the inspection of horses and the veterinary inspections pre-race, which are now incredibly stringent, to do everything we possibly can to reduce um, poor welfare outcomes. And that's why we've now got, as I said earlier, we're now in a position where 99.82% you know, of horses are coming back perfectly yeah. safe and sound with an independent horse welfare board overlooking all of this. That's really important. You know, we're not marking our own homework on this stuff. And being able to get some of those proof points out there um, has been something we've probably had a better platform to do because of some of the protests that have happened. This to me screams, you, when you have an inaccurate perception issue, right, nowadays a great way to fix it is by increasing someone's access to it. Everything you yep. just talked about there makes me think, okay, there's a huge amount there that I didn't know yep. that I now think yep. is far better regulated than it probably was mm. in, the wider, um, in the wider media. Isn't this a great opportunity for like a behind the scenes documentary for a but year or so? and following a yard for whatever it could be, the jockey yeah. club. You know, I think Andrew Balling's um, horsepower, horsepower was We've a great him. start. It's Fantastic, brilliant. right? Yeah. But what about, what about this to fix it? Because if you do see that care and attention, and you see the, the investment and you see the, the passion and security and, and, and everything that goes into that, that helps you win that argument Correct. for the middle ground. Yeah. So the one thing, so there's two two strands to that. I'll come to the come to the behind the scenes in a minute because we're just in the middle of filming something at the minute. I think the important, really other really important point here is that we want people to come and see it for themselves. You know, come to Lambourne on Good Friday when it's on, when it isn't rained off as it was this year, but that's another story. <laughs> come to Newmarket the third Saturday and third Sunday in September. Come to Middleham, you know, when, when they when they have their, um, I think also on Good Friday, when they have their open day. Come and see into the stables. The large majority of some of the top trainers 
are opening up their stables to the public on those days so that people can see the horses in training, horses, how well they're cared for, you know, on the in the saunas, in the on the horse walks and in the stable. And we want people to come and see that for themselves. And honestly, Charlie, the crowds we see in some of these days are huge. Because people want people are interested. I mean, you don't get into Body Mirror Heath to see Aston Villa train or Finch Farm to see Everton train, but you, you can go in behind the scenes on certain days, um, two yards to see what happens in racing behind the scenes. And there's actually nothing more, I think, thrilling than getting close to them on the gallops as well when they're actually doing their workouts in the mornings. I mean, if if you ever if you ever get a chance to go to one of those places I mentioned, Newmarket or Lambourne, and see the horses actually training um, close up. In the, of an early morning yeah. in some great you know, countryside scenery. That is an absolutely fantastic experience. But you are right in terms of your your question. You know, the, the, the behind the scenes opportunities that racing has, the fact that at the minute we're working with, a, with ITV and with a production company called South Shore to effectively tell the story of the current jump season underway. So they started filming uh, on Boxing Day at Kempton, and they're going to finish, I think, uh, either at the Grand National or at Sandown at the end of the jump season. And that is what they're, exactly what they're going to be doing. They're going to be telling the story of this current jump season, and that's going to be on ITV um, in a prime time slot in July, July and August. And I think you're going to find that that's going to bring out quite a few personalities who might not otherwise have been known, mm. who really you know, become sort of ambassadors for the sport. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, especially trainers, but especially jockeys, you know, becoming stars of the sport and promoting those stars. You know, people who young fans now especially love personalities. You know, my my, my daughter loves Virgil Van Dyke. They they identify with people. I identified more with Liverpool. Yeah, in Rush, kind of least Mark Lawrence, and absolutely. But it was about the team. I think for this generation, it's more about individuals and jockeys. And they do this brilliantly, by the way, in Japan and in Hong Kong. The jockeys are really promoted as stars. And I think things like this docu series, certainly for the jumps jockeys, well, is a major opportunity for some of them. People like new Nico de Bonville, Harry Skelton, Harry Cobden, I, I think who all of whom will feature in it, I think are going to come out of this really strongly as personalities because that's what they are and that's what they need to be promoted as. And the, the welfare element obviously come, becomes part of that as well in terms of being able to demonstrate that. You're doing my job for me. That was literally <laughs> the kind of the, the feed. In. Sorry. No, I love it. No, yeah. but, but it's brilliant because it shows that you're thinking about it. And yeah, it's something we talk about a lot on here. We had a, a fantastic conversation with David Buttress, who owns Dragons, yeah. uh, one of the United Rugby Championship teams. And star culture, creating those individuals within the sport of rugby, for example, but also within a team that isn't necessarily the most yeah. famous team, yeah. was a huge part of that conversation. Because as you said, people now follow the athlete as much as they do yeah. the badge. And there are so many examples yeah. of that. Well, every, everyone talks, and every, I used to get this question all the time, why can we do a drive to survive? Well, in effect, that's what we're doing here. No, I, I, I don't like copycatting. But you know, we saw. I'm quite a big Formula One fan. You know, when 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 Prost and Senna retired quite a few years ago. Now, or obviously not Senna didn't retire, but that's very obviously very sad what happened to him. But fundamentally, everyone had heard of those two. Why was that? Probably because Senna ran Prost off the um, at the start of Suzuka in about 1988 or 89, at the last race of the season when they were going for both going for the championship. And everyone that was an iconic sporting moment. And racing, I think we're probably at a point now where you know people had heard of Piggott, Eddery. More recently, McCoy, De Tory, with the possible, with the possible exception of Frankie, they're all gone now. Mm. So the, the sport needs new stars, and this is where this docu series I think becomes really important. You know, on the flat, you've got you know Tom Marquand and Holly Doyle, both young jockeys, married to each other. Also, demonstration that you know uh, this is a sport where women and men compete perfectly equally. You know, with Rachel Blackmore winning both the Cheltenham Gold Cup and the, the Grant National in recent years. You've got Holly winning some huge races on the flat, not mm -hmm. just in this country, but around the world. So that demonstration as well and that narrative is really, really important and really elevating them and their talents and their personalities is going to be key. But you mentioned Drive to Survive. To me, the best thing about that was just bringing a personality to the individual. My relationship with a Formula One driver pre-Drive to Survive, within reason, right, if I'm watching the race, was the helmet. That was it. Yep. I, I didn't really have a great affinity with the face. Mm. And to not have a great affinity with the face makes it far harder to create yes. that culture around the individuals that make you want to follow and support them. Yeah. I, I feel like 
that is a similar type of challenge that it sounds like you're over, you're going to it overcome. Is, with I mean, e even down to things as basic as I mean, need to be careful what I say here, who I offend. But if you take take O'Sheen Murphy, who is um, who was um, who is a personality and it definitely had his off. He won't mind me saying I said his off track issues, and he's he's very much on track now. I think it's fair to say. But you know, in some ways, he's. You know, he, he promotes himself really well on social media as a personality. He comes out of the weighing room without his helmet on, to your point. Very few jockeys do that. I think they should all be doing that because I think it should make them more, more relatable, more recognisable um, if, they, if they come out and, they, all, and, and you, they walk, as you probably know, at most courses they walk to get out of the weighing room into the parade ring to get on the horse. They will be walking through the crowd. You know, just as an aside, there are very few sports where you can interact you know, as directly and, and closely with the jockeys and the trainers as you can in racing. Mm. But Oshin's very clever because he comes out without his helmet on, so people recognise him. And people obviously recognise him from social media as well. I think that's what all jockeys should be doing because it, it's a small thing, but it really helps them promote themselves and the sport in general and them as personalities. And we're going to be using a lot more sort of green, green screen content and that sort of stuff and introducing them and really elevating them over the, over the coming years. And I think the docuseries really helps with that as well. But when it comes down to how you present it and, and the discussions you have about moving this forward and innovating and managing the perception issue, something like what we had last year with the Rachel Blackmore pre-Cheltenham advert to me was a very interesting thing because you again, you had one side who had campaigned for something, removing a whip from a poster, yeah. another side who go, this is yeah. crazy. How does that impact your ability to speak to, again, those fans and make sure that you're winning the hearts and minds of the middle people when marketing the events that you're putting on? Yeah, you're speaking, because you are speaking to different audiences, there's no question about that, and different, and as we said earlier, diff, different people have different expectations of you know, of, of the race day that they're, that they're coming to. I think in that, in that particular case, I think with the whip, we probably, we probably, I don't think we'd do that again. I think we went too far. The, you know, the, the, the whip, um, where there is very significant regulation around its use, is a core part of you know a, a jockey's you know equipment, if you will, and actually very important for safety as well as for for being used for encouragement. Very strict, significant regulations around that now, but definitely um, an area. And again, our polling shows us where people, so some people who want to be persuaded about the sport, have still got a perception issue. But as I say, very significant and clear numbers of times it can be used but ultimately making it clear to different audiences this is a sport that you know is changing is evolving is innovating um you know we're going to be doing we're, we're going to be doing more behind the scenes stuff we're going to be doing more stuff around we talked earlier about data use of data and stride lengths we talked about so what do you mean when you, when you say doing more around data how's that going to so be so we're working at the minute with a business called ellipse R race iq is the name of the, the product but they're the same company who do um wimbledon and you've probably heard of quick Viz as well mm. so using and 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 racing is a sport bit like cricket where the amount of data around form around different horses in different conditions um, the, the, where races are won and lost in terms of what's called jump efficiency, which is the sort of period from the from the um, just before the jump into just after the jump, the envelope it's called, being able to really analyse that in detail, showing where races are won and lost, um, is an absolutely key part of how you, how you innovate the coverage. Things like you know, we're, we're we're looking at things like jockey, we're wiring up jockeys before races in the way they've done. You've seen that work well in T Twenty cricket. Now there are integrity and potential safety issues in racing that don't exist in cricket obviously but yep. things like that were listening in on jockey trainer um conversations in in the parade ring before the before the jockey gets on the horse things like that that really elevate the coverage and elevate the interest and give people a real sense of behind the scenes you know we've some we've also done some um behind the scenes stuff in the, if there's a steward's inquiry effectively you know almost like a courtroom where each jockey is giving his or her side of the story that's pretty compelling TV as well. And being able to use some of that behind the scenes content we're not currently capturing, I think to that wider, newer audience is really, really important. So let's talk about international landscape as yeah. well. What is the role of the international racing industry in what you do? And yeah. how do you work together with yeah. these different regions? It's a hugely important part of what we do, especially on the flat. I mean, obviously, the interaction liaison with Ireland and France on the jumps in terms of programming, in terms of the, the, the positioning of certainly of the big festivals through so Cheltenham, Entry, Punchestown at this time of the year is key. But the international element becomes really important on the flat. 
the, the fact is that flat racing and breeding now is a is effectively an international activity. Um, we have owners who own horses in the UK, but also in many other countries. Um, we have horses who will be going to breed in other countries. We have horses who will be going to r- race in other countries. You know, a lot of the horses we saw um, racing in the Middle East over our winter will be racing here in the summer. Um, so it becomes a sort of effectively a, a collaborative and cooperative effort in many ways. Yes, we are competing for runners up to a point. Yes, we are seeing, and the one of the biggest challenges I think we've got is that we've we're seeing um, some decent flat horses being exported abroad because they can win probably lesser races in places like Hong Kong and Australia for quite a lot more money. And that's a function of the funding model, which we might come on to. But fundamentally, the international um, interaction and the international liaison in terms of us getting runners over here from the likes of um, Japan and Australia to our big flat festivals is really, really important and becoming more important. Cooperating also with the Breeders' Cup, we've got um, win at what's called win in your in races for the, for the Kentucky Derby into our Derby. Um, so things like that, where you start to knit together an international program for a horse, is, is only going to become more and more important. Do we have a live golf issue of tradition versus dollar spend? You mentioned there about lesser yeah. races, paying more, attracting yeah. uh, the stars, should we say. Um, that's obviously not unique. To horse racing, no, we're seeing it in a lot of places. How are you yeah. managing that as an organisation? Yeah, I wouldn't. I'd say at the minute, it's probably one of the single biggest issues facing the sport in this country. Um, we are seeing um, big prize funds, state-backed prize funds, predominantly in places like Hong Kong, Middle East, even Australia as well. Where, in very simple terms, the percentage that those jurisdictions take from the betting on their races is, is proportionately much higher than, than we have under the horse race betting levy in this country, which means that some of our prize funds are falling behind some of theirs. Why is that important? That's important because ultimately that impacts the number of horses in training in this country and the number of people working in the industry. That's why we're talking to government about how we extend and reform that levy so that we have a so that we're on a level playing field. I mean, I'll give you a really good example, very simple example. An, an overseas race that's being bet on here, so a race from South Africa or Hong Kong or Australia or wherever, um, attracts um, gain into their levy system, but not into ours. So in effect, there's a double whammy effect where people betting in this country um, and people betting on an overseas race in this country are benefiting the overseas jurisdiction, but not benefiting us. Same is true in Ireland. So that's where there's a that's where there's a disparity where we're saying to the government we need a level playing field here so that our industry can compete on a much more equal footing with some of those other jurisdictions. But ultimately, if you go abroad and you talk to people abroad about British racing, it is still probably the best regarded in the world, and and, and I think will remain so just in terms of its its integrity, its prestige, its heritage, its history. People, where do where do people still want to win more than anything on the jump? Certainly at Cheltenham. Where do people want to win on the flat more than anywhere? The Derby or Royal Ascot? I don't see that changing, but we don't need to be complacent on this. Yeah. And I think levelling up, if you will, um, our funding system against some of those international... Maybe not, we're, never, we're never going to compete with Saudi and Dubai on the money, but certainly <coughs> getting closer to them and, have, and making it more attractive for people to have horses in training in this country, both on the jumps and on the flat, and quality horses as well, has never been more important. How important are the individuals uh, in, should we say, UK racing um, that are putting in huge numbers, like your Michael O'Leary's, like your JP McManus's, yeah. in this conversation? Do you have to work very closely with those individuals to help keep the integrity and prominence of UK racing? Soon after I joined the Jockey Club, my then boss, who was then CEO, Simon Bazalgette, said to me, and he had this always stuck with me, you've got to remember, Nevin, it's one big joint venture. And in effect, it is. There are, there are a lot of stakeholders you've just mentioned two very important stakeholders, but there are many others. Our job is to ensure that not only do they have, you know, they maintain interest and investment in the sport and all the other owners with them, but also that they have, they prefer to have the horses training in this country. You know, we're, we're increasingly seeing, there are some examples of UK owners who have their horses in training in Ireland with, you know, certainly on the jumps with, you know, with Henry de Bromhead or, or Willie Mullins and people like that. And that's great for the sport because those people are still investing in the sport and we still get the benefit of them running over here when they come to Cheltenham 
or entry or our big festivals. But we prefer those people who are investing with you know, Nicky Henderson and Paul Nichols. It doesn't mean that Nicky and Paul on the rail aren't getting good backing from other owners, but we would prefer those British owners to be investing with British trainers. It's our job to find a way of making sure, from a funding point of view, to make sure that happens. So, and ultimately, extending ownership as well beyond those individuals is also incredibly important. You know, I don't think investing and the importance of syndicates has ever been more important than it is now. You know, there is a, it's about demonstrating that actually owning racehorses and investing in racehorses is, is probably more accessible and more affordable if you do it with, you know, 15 or 20 of you or even 10 of you, um, probably more accessible than people think. Now, you can't go out and buy, unless you're David Butlers, you can't go out and buy a rugby club or a football club, but you can invest in, you know, a share in a racehorse and the experience that you then have that we certainly in our racehorse business and in our gallops business are, are responsible for providing is key to keeping them engaged and keeping them investing in the sport. A lot of sole owners who end up, i.e. people who go end up owning horses on their own, start through syndicates. That's why a lot of people come in and that element of you know, syndicates winning and being seen to win big races on big days. You know, we saw Stage Star win the Novice Chase at the festival, not just one gone, but the one before. Massive syndic with Paul Nichols. Flooring Porters won the stairs hurdle, you know, twice in the last three years. Again, huge syndicate of people, just, you know, and when people see that enjoyment and that engagement that you get from being a syndic and winning at a big festival, that hooks yeah. people in. So, so it's those top owners are incredibly important to us, but it's about making sure that you expand the gospel, if you will, of horse ownership as being probably far more accessible than people think. I think all of this now comes back to the final point or kind of topic that I really wanted to cover, which is governance and yeah. bringing it all together to be able to do a lot of the things that we've talked about. Now, you've already talked about acting in a lot of ways rather than planning and strategizing. So there's already a huge amount clearly that has and is being done. Yeah. But what is it like within the racing landscape from a governance perspective? And what is your ability to actually affect change where it's required? Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually it's, it's at the heart of how sport really moves forward, I think. We, we've, we've come, I feel like we've come a long way in terms of the change we have made and the innovations we have introduced, but I think there's still a lot more to do. And you have the difficulty in racing, where, as we, we alluded to this earlier, where you have you know, an incredible number of stakeholders, both within the tent of the sport, you know, the race courses, the owners, the BHA obviously as regulator, the trainers, the jockeys, and the, and the stable staff, but also you know on the peri not on the periphery, but stick important stickles just out directly outside of the sport, you know, the betting operators, the sponsors, the broadcasters, and ultimately the fans. And everyone has a has a stake in this, and everyone quite rightly has a say. So being in a position where you can um, actually get decisions made, I think, and being able to give you know, one entity probably more power than any only one entity or person has got at the minute, I think is actually really important. I think there's a we've done a good job um already of, of streamlining things a bit, but I think I think over time we're gonna to need to go a little bit further. And I think there's a degree to which at times we can be a little bit hamstrung by the fact that there are so many stakeholders. So it's difficult to get you'll never do it by consensus. So you do have to crack some eggs sometimes. And I think as a sport we're probably maybe at times a little bit reticent about cracking those eggs because ultimately, why do people engage, get into a sport? They get into it because of its top end. Mm. You know, we all, how did I get into football? Watching Northern Ireland in the World Cup in 1982, watching FA Cup finals. It wasn't with respect, you know, the, the sort of football I watch now from week to week at Woking, which is still the fifth level, but I still love it. But I, I engaged, first of all, because I was watching Northern Ireland, I was watching Liverpool, I was watching those brilliant cup finals in the 80s. Hmm. Racing's no different. People engage because they see a Royal Ascot, they see a Cheltenham Festival, they see probably above all a Grand National. So the sport needs to do more, in my opinion, to accentuate and to differentiate its top end from the rest of the sport because ultimately that's what hooks people in, that's what engages people and everyone wins on a rising tide. And at the moment, in my opinion, Probably our governance structure probably doesn't quite reflect that. And I think that's where we probably need to be as a sport and as a group a little bit braver in some of the decisions we do make about accentuating and really 
emphasising that top end. The opportunity is there to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, racing has never had more of a following sort of on social media than it has now. The engagement levels are high. You know, people people want to be persuaded that this is a sport they can really interact with. And all the behind the scenes stuff we talked about earlier, I think is a really, really important part of that because there aren't many other sports who can offer that. So, you know, let's as a sport we should really be, you know, maximizing the use of those assets in making sure that we really accentuate our top end festivals and also accentuating the uh, like another element we haven't covered is the impact we have on communities as well. You know, everyone talks about, you know, those communities we talked about earlier, the new markets, the Lambourns, the Midlands, but actually race courses are important community assets too. You're only racing, you know, 30 days a year, a lot less in some cases. So it was a huge opportunity for race courses, a lot of work we do in local communities to reach out to people who you know bring them in on non-race days to do events to do all sorts of to do all sorts of things that you can use that space for i do want to talk about this because yeah. we did mention it racing like has it has incorporated much more than just the race day yeah so how's that how has that fitted into the strategy why was it so important to make sure that you had the james blunt concert after mm. a day of the races yeah. in bringing a variety of value to the industry. You just yeah. mentioned it's so important to community, but also I'd imagine just important to speaking again to new audiences. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's really important to be able to show, demonstrate to people that this is a sport that is open, that is welcoming, that is accessible to all. Because back to your perception point from earlier on, the perception of some would be that it's not. But every time I bring someone new into a race course, be it friends, be it family, be it charity partners, whatever, people who've never been racing before, they are just amazed at the, at the sheer accessibility that you get at a race day. And then being able to show the people that actually there's more than just racing that you can use these assets for. You know, if, if you part of our long-term property vision for our race courses is to have them as effectively community or even you know, other sporting assets. You know, you could do, um, you could, we could build hotels, we could build country clubs, we could build um, gyms, we could build, you know, other, other things you can use the land for. Um, that makes it far more accessible on non-race days. And even to, even now, you know, about 12, 10, 12% of our business is not related to racing at all because we're doing everything from, you know, weddings to wakes to, you know, corporate um, away days and, and all sorts of other things besides. So being able to demonstrate to people that we are working in those local communities, as part of those local communities with local businesses, showing that, you know, there's a diversity of activity. You can have, you mentioned music nights. Mm-hmm. That's a great example. Um, but there's so much else and so much other potential in these venues. And actually, from our point of view, ultimately our business is about asset utilization. So commercially, it makes sense as well. But how do you how do you utilize the asset away from just its race days? Take Sandown as a great example of that. You've got a, both a driving range, um, a pitch and putt, and a cart track, all in the what we call the infield of the race course. Um, And we see, as part of our property master planning work that that we've done, we're doing at the minute, we only see upside potential in that in terms of how those higher higher venues are utilized and operated. So it's an increasing priority within the organization now. Because I think ultimately, you you want to diversify your revenue streams as well. And we're very clear that there's there's two strands to it, really. One is sort of capital development and development of the space in terms of what you might build. But the other is much more basic. It's basically saying, what can you use this space for in terms of pop-ups? You know, we've a good good example. We buy any car and are using some of our sites pop-ups. No, it's not gonna it's not gonna be life-changing stuff for us, but you don't need to get too many of those and all the things like it to start making a, a fairly significant commercial difference. So how you utilize the space imaginatively um, and how you get people thinking a bit more flexibly about how that works outside of race days it's only going to become more important over time. I'd love to go into a quick fire. What single thing has created the most pushback internally when you've been talking about all of these changes and developments to make? I think, and we're still not there, but I think it's for, for good reasons what we've been miking up with jockeys. I'd love to do that. And I think I can see a time when we will do that. But I think, you know, the, the Professional Jockey Association, you know, really brilliant organization who represent jockeys extremely well. They're not in the way of this by any means, but there's certainly been discussions about how does that work in practice from an integrity point of view. But I think 
everyone accepts that the sport needs to change, needs to innovate, and has massive potential to do so. But there are issues we need to work through on some of these things that we're thinking about. We've heard a lot about Nevin, the executive, and the decisions that you'll make. Yeah. What about Nevin, the person outside of racing? Ooh. Um, so I'm passionate about other sports. Um, football, cricket, rugby union. I probably don't watch as much of them live as I'd like because um, racing is obviously a big part of my life at the weekends as well. But Liverpool fan, uh, by Liverpool, the sounds of it. Woking, Northern Ireland. Yeah, if I, it would be rare for me to miss a Northern Ireland game at Windsor Park. And I have a ticket that you basically right. just every campaign, every two years, you just renew it and I just renew it. Big family man, um, wife, two children. My wife runs her own business writing wills, trusts, powers of attorney. Our girls are 15 and 12, um, so they take up for a bit of our time at the weekends. Luckily, they enjoy coming racing when they can. Um, the younger one loves coming to Liverpool games with me as well when we can. Um, we went to the cup final against Chelsea. Oh. Two cup finals against Chelsea actually recently. Carabao Cup this year and FA Cup uh, two, last, no, two years ago. Um, I was at both as well, just sitting you were on the, the other side. In the other half. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I love my garden. That's actually where I do some of my best thinking. Yeah. And you know, I love my history, my politics. You know, I can't get enough of that. I've recently discovered the Rest is History podcast with um, Tom Holland and Dominic yeah. Sandbrook. Yeah. So that sort of stuff just keeps me you know, relaxed. There are lots of racing podcasts that you sort of have to listen to, yeah. <laughs> um, which I actually enjoy. Yeah. But um, I you know that's very much work. Cause you've got to, there's a lot of content that gets filled. You, people are sort of expressing opinions on things, some of which you agree with, some of which you don't. Oh, but, yeah. um, no, I, I, and I like to, I, I'm really clear with myself that I want to give, th this job could consume you. And sometimes it does, but having a really good balance to your life, both family and beyond is, you know, I think incredibly important. So away from racing, if you could have one job in sport, what would it be? Oof. I'm not sure what the current incumbent of said job would would feel like. Um, it would probably be, I think it would be CEO of the ECB. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that would probably be the one. And I mean, in some ways, it is, a, it is an odd dichotomy, actually, because I, I like, I think the reason, one of the reasons I've stayed in racing for so long is because when I came into it, and even still, you know, I'm not, I'm not passionately engaged. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I really enjoy it, and I love the bigger days, and both on the flat and on the jumps, but is it, is it in my sort of DNA, like, like cricket and football, or probably not? And I think in many ways that's a good thing because you're making really, sometimes really difficult business decisions around the sport. So I think the big test for me, if I went into a sport that you know, I was even bigger fan of, cricket, football, rugby union would all be in that category. The big test for me, I think the big test for a lot of people going into those sports is whether or not you can keep your passion for the sport at arm's length when you're having to make hard-headed business decisions. What's your biggest challenge in the job? I think it's the process of making the changes we want to make to make the sport even more open, even more welcome, even more accessible, to break down some of those perception barriers whilst bringing the, the core group of racing fans and you know, some of our internal stakeholders along with us. So I think, it's I think not alienating. That's the, it's not alienating people yeah. whilst trying to drive change. Now, I'm of a view that in some cases you probably you go ahead and make the change and you know, ask for forgiveness later. That's probably a good example. Good example of that was probably the dress codes change that we made. You know, we didn't consult on that as a team. We decided, my, myself mm -hmm. and my senior team and others in the business decided that was an absolute no-brainer in terms of being able to demonstrate the sport was open and welcoming. There was some a bit of pushback on that, not too much, but a bit. And that's fine. People are entitled to their views. But ultimately, if we want this sport to grow, if we want this sport to break, be able to break down some of those negative perceptions, and, and I believe they are perceptions rather than reality that we've talked about, then you have to make brave moves like that. Do you fear for the future of jump racing? Not really. I think there's increasingly view that you know, use of animals in sport is questionable. But I think, so I think for us, the incumbent on, incumbency on us is to make sure that we're demonstrating that this sport is increasingly evolving, changing, becoming even safer than it is at the minute. And I think we're on a good trajectory on that. But I think we can't be complacent and we certainly have to be in a position where constantly demonstrating change and evolution. If that means that we we make changes that are 
that some see as you know coming away from the heritage of the sport, then I think we'd rather have a sport in some form that is safe and is well perceived than be in danger of having no sport at all. Final one from me. Grand National is around the corner. Talk us through the run up to a major event like yeah. the Grand National. You know, you're obviously interacting, liaising with the team around the commercial performance. So we've got a good we've got a good readout on that. We, we've got a very good sense of you know hospitality sales patterns, ticket sales patterns, right from in the case of the Grand National, really from sort of November December onwards. So we know where we're heading commercially, sort of very very um, in much, in a lot of detail and very quickly during that sort of January to March period. So obviously liaising on that and making sure that we understand what that means and what that means for our investment model for the rest of the year, because the Grand National and alongside Cheltenham are our two biggest events. I think you then got a lot of work with the team, just making sure that you know the, the site's in shape, that everything's coming along operationally. I don't need to get too involved in that, but just having a bit of an oversight of that is always a good idea. Understanding what's new each year, you know, in terms of new innovation around the side. We've got River Island this year as our style partner, for example. So there's always something new and different every year in terms of how we're sort of um, in terms of how we're pitching the event. Um, but the biggest thing for me in the build up is um, I guess the uh, the media coverage, things like you know, we're making sure that we're putting the media well beyond just the core racing media. They're important sports media, but actually getting it out there in terms of the wider um, the wider sort of entertainment media business and so on. Podcasts like this are very useful in that respect. Um, I'm making sure that we're taking every opportunity we can because ultimately my, my job, um, along with you know others, is to is to really front the event up and, and and sell it and sell it properly as one of our you know our most iconic sporting events. It's as simple as that. And as an event that a lot of people very much identify with, and in in this case probably is their only in some cases their only interaction with racing for the mm -hmm. whole year. So selling the sport, selling the event, making sure that people understand you know the the real true value of it in terms of its value to you know the sport liverpool the fans and the worldwide audience that it that it, that it brings that's my main job nevin this has been really fascinating i've loved how open you've been with it so great thank you so much for joining us i've loved it thank you very much thank you